<clears throat> All right. Well, I preached this morning uh, in Sunday school in Iola from chapter 8, where it says, The truth uh, shall make you free. I had to be careful I didn't say set you free, because that was the misquoted way of saying it. But uh, the truth shall make you free. And uh, some of the, in my preparation, my study, and some of my thoughts kind of ran together with that and then studying for this message. So trying to keep all these straight, but they kind of go, in my mind, they kind of go together. It's kind of hard to explain, but I want to focus primarily on chapter 10, uh, verse 28. And here is the verse that is the soul winning verse that we're going to talk about the context, but here's the verse that we'll quote sometimes. John 10, 28 says, and uh Well, let's start with 27. But my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now, I've heard that verse my whole life in uh, preaching the gospel It's obviously a great eternal security verse. No man can pluck you out of my hands. Uh, You've probably all heard the illustration like you're in Jesus' hands. And and I've had in children's church, they would always have somebody come up and try to get something out of the preacher's hands. And they can't get the hand open. And they're like, imagine if you're in Jesus' hand. And these are great illustrations. And uh, ultimately... The idea of eternal security is definitely in this text, but the purpose of this, and so I don't mind anyone using that out soul winning, but the purpose of this series is to look at the context behind it and kind of get a better understanding of what that verse is. Now, I wanted to mention this, that I'm in this series, I've just kind of gone through the normal verses that we'd use out soul winning. Uh, there's a few that we might mention that I just, I never really dealt with, but uh, for the most part, I kind of went in order of how we would normally present normally present it, and I s- saved this one for last. And I want to make it clear that when we're presenting the gospel, we don't necessarily go through the gospel plan and then later on explain eternal security. It's kind of something that should be part of the presentation. And I'm not always like real careful to to explain that. But I believe that anybody, if, if they've heard and understood the gospel presentation, you know, well, if they, if they really get it, it should kind of be implied. And then you can kind of touch on that a little bit as well. Uh, but whenever I was a kid, I remember um, going through some soul winning lessons, you know, even in Bible college. Uh, and I remember it being presented like after you go through the gospel, after they pray, after they receive Christ, then go back and teach them about eternal security. And I kind of feel like, like I was saying, you kind of ought to have them already, they should already understand eternal security before they ever pray because they got, they're, they're understanding that, you know, this is a gift. I'm not doing anything to earn it. And so I can't do anything to lose it. And so that's kind of like we've started, you know, I think most in here kind of incorporate that into the whole presentation and receiving the gift. Hey, a gift's not something that, God's going to come back and take away from you or, or whatever the case. But, uh, but this is an important verse, and sometimes a person has to be reminded about eternal security because they get kind of confused through teachings that are out there or whatever. And so we might take them to this verse, and, uh, and I, I love the fact, the, the illustration of the hand, and then his hand is in the Father's hand, and, and I even talk about how the Holy Spirit you know, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit, and so there's this idea of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all are involved in this keeping us uh, saved and sealed until the day of redemption. It's good preaching, but we want to look at the context, and um, you know, I think we might look at it in a different way. If you've never really studied this chapter out, maybe you didn't think of it uh, this way. And so I think that the key to understanding everything that I'm going to preach here this morning is at the end of the chapter. Let's look at verse 39. <clears throat> starting verse 39, Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And many restored unto him, a resort, I'm sorry, many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracles, but all things that John spake of this spake of this man were true and many believed on him there. 
Uh, now, again, I'm, I'm getting a little bit mixed up with uh, my lesson in Sunday school because a couple chapters ago, there's this big dissertation on those who aren't believing Jesus, and he's explaining to them how they're blinded, and they don't receive the truth, and that's why, you know, they're going to die in their sins. But he says those who believe in the truth, you know, those are the ones who are going to have life, and those are the ones that see, and they have the truth, and the truth will make, uh, make them free. And so, uh, and so anyway, this got to realize is a continuation here a couple chapters later. So interestingly, he points back to John the Baptist. And I want to uh, make that clear here in a minute, but uh, I think it's important to some degree to understand what the nature of God's people was during that time. All right, now this is where it gets a little confusing in terms of salvation of the Jews, uh, because there are some crazy teachings out there, and uh, there's uh, there is a theology called dispensationalism, which in and of itself could mean lots of different things. Okay, I went to uh, one of the Bible colleges I went to would call themselves dispensational, but they wouldn't go as far as what I'm about to tell you. And that is this, there's one belief within that umbrella of dispensationalism that believes that in the Old Testament, Jews were saved by works. Okay, so them having to do sacrifices and having to do all these things, like basically, if they didn't do those things, they wouldn't go to heaven. But then when Jesus came, he did away with that. And now it's, it's salvation through grace, uh, you know, by faith in Jesus Christ. Well, let me just tell you this. There's nowhere in the Bible that says they got saved in a different way in the Old Testament. So what that is, is man's trying to reason out by saying, well, Jesus, and I've heard people just make a big deal about this. Well, Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. So how could they be saved through faith in Jesus Christ if he hadn't died on the cross yet? Well, isn't it interesting that starting in the first chapter of the Bible, you know, I guess third chapter, we already see an atonement being made for sins and this prophecy about the seed. And, uh, and, and then we see the next chapter, there's like a sacrifice, which has to do with a blood sacrifice. And, uh, and everything is a picture of Jesus. In the law, there's talk about the this promised one that's going to come all throughout the prophets. I mean, everyone is saying that there, I mean, there's some verses, I mean, we're reading one in Isaiah 53 right now, we're, we're learning it. Such clear prophecies about Jesus who is going to come. Did they understand it? No, they didn't understand everything. Even whenever he's, Jesus is walking around with his disciples and saying, I got to go and suffer many things and die. They're like, no, 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 you're the Messiah. You can't, you know, so they didn't understand it. But their faith was in Jesus. Their faith was that he was the promised one. He was a son of God. He was the one that they're putting their faith in. And then they, and then, you know, later on after he died on the cross, then it was like, okay, you know, th this is what he was talking about. And they're filled with the spirit and uh, the book of Acts and all that. Okay. So here's the question. Now, if somebody before Jesus was on the scene, if somebody was, uh, was a, a Jew, did they, and, and they died, did they just automatically go to heaven? Well, of course not, because not every Jew necessarily had faith in the Messiah. They had, didn't necessarily have faith in God's plan. You know, and again, nobody understood it exactly, but many had faith in, the, in, in you know, God's word and his promises that he, that he would come. They just trusted what little bit that they knew. And this is why today we got to understand that a lot of people, I mean, a child can get saved with very little understanding of the gospel, but just the very basics. And when they understand that and they put their faith in that, you know, they can be saved at a young age. Now you hear lots of stories about kids who do that as a young and a young age, and they really didn't understand it. And later on they really get saved and they're like, well, I didn't completely understand it back then. And so, uh, you know, at what point did they get, was it, they saved the first time or the second time? You know, I, I don't know. Obviously you're only saved once <laughs> you don't get resaved. Okay, but there are times where people didn't understand it, claimed to believe, they believed in vain, like Paul says, or whatever. Uh, but uh, the faith in God, the faith in God's plan. Now, I understand now you can't just say faith in God uh, or faith in God's word. You're going to have to be more specific. Now it's faith in what the Bible has revealed about Jesus Christ and his death on the cross, burial, resurrection. I mean, you, you have to, you're going to have to understand a little bit more now, just like, you know, in this generation where Jesus is literally walking around on earth, there are people, I believe, who are saved who don't even know who he is. 
and they're still walking around on earth while Jesus is here, but they haven't been introduced to him. They don't know him yet. I believe if they died, you know, as long as they were, they still had faith and they, you know, they just didn't know that would be, that would be a possibility that, that if they died, they'd still go to heaven uh, because of their faith. I hope that didn't confuse anybody, but I'm going to try to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, get a little deeper into this here in a second. Uh, so, you know, but then once introduced, here's the question. So John the Baptist is on the scene and says, hey, behold, the Lamb of God has taken away the sins of the world. Now, if a Jew said, nah, I don't believe in, that that's him. You know, I do believe in the Messiah, but he's not the one. Now, would they be saved then? Because here's the thing. We got a lot of people today who claim to be Jews who say, oh, I believe in the Messiah, but that guy that came, Jesus Christ, he was an imposter. Can, are they saved? Absolutely not. Because they rejected Jesus when they heard about that he has already come and that he was the one who uh, died for our sins and all that. They rejected that. Now, it's important to keep that in your mind because a lot of times we interpret everything in the Bible that it's exactly, now we can, everything in the Bible is for us in the sense that we can get something from that and apply it to ourselves in one way or another. But we can't look at every story in the Bible and just read everything that, it, that it's going to exactly fit our situation. Okay, so, uh, so I want to, I keep on bringing up John the Baptist because I'm going to, we're going to start by talking about his role in this, in this parable here in a second. All right, so... Uh, John the Baptist was prophesied in the Old Testament as this voice in the wilderness, okay? And it's one who came to prepare the way of the Lord. Look at Malachi chapter 3, 1. Last book of the Old Testament. Malachi 3, 1 says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Now back up to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 2 says, Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her. Uh, that's not it. What did I do wrong here? Uh, let me see. Isaiah. What did I do? I hate that. It's in here somewhere. <laughs> About preparing the way. I know it's it. Let me just keep reading. 40 verse 3. Okay, there you go. Sorry, I just had to keep reading. That's what I thought. <laughs> so, uh, receive of the Lord the double, uh, 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 Lord's hand double for her sins. Verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. I don't know why it is, but when you're preaching and you have one of those moments, it's like everything just turns white and you can't find anything you're looking for. All right, go over to Ma uh, Matthew chapter 3 now. Matthew chapter 3. Now we just read from Isaiah chapter 40. And so you're reading through your Bible and let's just say you know, you were able to comprehend everything you read and you got through Isaiah and you read that verse, went to Malachi 3, you read that verse, and now you start in the New Testament, the very next book after Malachi. And once you get to Matthew chapter 3, you read verse 3. It says, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his uh, raiment of camel hair and leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the regions round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. Okay, So <clears throat> some had received, during the time of, of Jesus walking on earth, some had received through John's preaching and through John's baptism, they had received the fact that Jesus was the Christ. Others followed him. Others were flocking to him, watching and waiting to see the miracles and to see what he was going to do and what he was going to preach. And through that, a lot of them came to believe in him. Uh, but then there were others who never believed him. You know, this is like the uh, Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers. A lot of them, you know, they had their own belief. 
And even though they, you know, claimed to be religious leaders of, of God, Jehovah, they had their own beliefs. And so they rejected in their heart. They never received Jesus Christ as their Messiah. So now, as we think about this parable that, that Jesus is telling all throughout John chapter 10 here, he keeps coming back to this wonderful parable about the sheep. Here are the components of this, of this parable. Okay, you've got the sheepfold. Now, how you visualize that in your head, I don't know. I always visualize this big stone uh, kind of wall around it. And there's this huge uh, sheepfold where the sheep are. There is mention of thieves and robbers. Now, how would you know a thief and robber? Well, uh, they're going to be trying to sneak in to get into the fold some other way than through the door. Okay, so another component of this parable is the door. Uh, so right there, um, you know, at the front of the gate, whatever, uh, there's a there's a big door that they have to open up for people to get in and out, for the sheep to go in, in and out. And uh, then there is the porter. The porter is the person who opens the door, right? And then finally, there is the shepherd. Okay, now he's using these over and over, and there's little bits within this chapter where he kind of explains what he's talking about. But let me just ask you, do you think that John the Baptist is one of the components to this parable? And which would he be if he was one of them? That's kind of a weird way to ask the question. So I believe that he is one of these components. Which is he going to be? Is he the door? No. Is he a, a sheep? I mean, I, I guess he's a sheep. But you know what he is in this story, I believe, is the porter. Okay, so let's talk about that for a minute. Okay, number one, the porter, which is John the Baptist. Now, he's not the door, but he's the doorman. That's what a porter is. Okay, somebody that's a, uh, you know, we might think about a greeter or an usher or somebody who opens up the door. Uh, besides, you, I mean, maybe you didn't notice, but there's a, actually a position in the White House uh, this historical, historically an important position, and that's the doorman, the person that opens up the door. Now, that was maybe what it used to be. He's got a bigger job that he fulfills now. I can't even think of what their actual name is. I don't think it's doorman, but uh, long, something along those lines. And he, uh, and so historically, there's always been been that person. And so I thought that was neat, you know, because, uh, you know, we, uh, when David says, I'd rather be a doorman in the house of God, you know, than, uh, how's he say it? Help, help me out. <laughs> My mind's going blank. I'd rather be a doorman in the house of God. So, uh, you know, this is what I think this doorman, this porter, this person who's opening up and allowing, you know, people to pass. And and so this is going to be the position of John the Baptist in the story. Notice uh, what we read in, cha in Matthew chapter 3. It said that all Judea came out to John the Baptist. That's huge, okay? This, is, this means like everyone who was a Jew who's been waiting for the Messiah because they should have been. They should have been, you know, they were taught. We know whenever Jesus was born, uh, there were people in the family that were, you know, praying for this, and they were, and they were you know, recognizing that he was the one. Uh, there were priests, you know, in the temple. There were prophets who were prophesying that he had come. And, and, uh, and so there, it, it should have been known among all those who called themselves Jews it should have been known that they were waiting on the Messiah. So here, word gets out and says, hey, this man down here is preaching and he's baptizing people and he's saying that the Messiah is here. And so all the nation, all the Jews in Jerusalem and the regions about, they all come to John the Baptist at one time or another. That's why through the rest of the story, all, even through the book of Acts, everyone's making reference back to their baptism whenever John the Baptist was out there preaching. It was a huge deal, okay, because this was the one which, by the way, was prophesied in the Old Testament. This one who's preparing the way for Jesus, for the Lord. And so he's, uh, he is this porter, if you will, that's opening the door. Now, if somebody rejected, if somebody rejected the Lord, because there were people that hated John the Baptist for sure, right? But if they rejected John the Baptist at the door, are, is it really John the Baptist that they had a problem with? No, it was the fact that that they didn't receive, they didn't want to receive Jesus. So any of John the Baptist preaching saying, hey, this is the Messiah. You need to turn to him. Here's the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. And they're like, oh, that weirdo eating honey and wearing hairy garments and stuff like that. And nobody liked John the Baptist. And, uh, you know, eventually uh, some 
a woman talked her husband into cutting his head off and putting it on a charger. And, and uh, why? Because they didn't like his preaching. They didn't like all that. So what is it really that they didn't like? They didn't like the Word of God. And I think about this sometimes. Here's just an analogy that I was thinking of like a porter, right? Somebody who opens up, and we're going to see here in a minute that Jesus is the is not just the shepherd, but he's also the door, okay? And so every time that somebody opens up the Bible to preach the Word of God, this is like a door, okay? This is like this is the Word of God. We're opening this up, and we're showing somebody the Word of God, and we're saying, hey, let me show you what the Bible says about this. And it's like this door's being opened that allows them to say, it's like, hey, behold, the Lamb of God was taken away the sins of the world, right? Now, if they, if they don't want anything to do with us, and they reject us. Is it really us that you know that they have a problem with? No, it's it's this it's Jesus that they have a problem with. They don't want to be confronted. They don't want to think that they might be wrong in their beliefs or or anything like that. They reject Jesus, which is funny because you know how many times have you been cussed out before someone even opened the door? They don't even know what you look like, but they're just mad because you're there, you know. Or the other thing is funny. It's like, oh, come on in. And they come to the door and they're smiling. And they're all happy. And then, and then they see your Bible and they're just like, oh. <laughs> it's like, who did you think? I, I mean, you know, just, you're just happy to welcome anybody, anybody that's out there because you have no idea who I am. Girl Scout cookies. Maybe I'm selling Girl Scout cookies. Well, everyone loves Girl Scout cookies. You know, maybe uh, that's, it's the neighbor asking for a cup of sugar. Or something. Do people still do that? I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, whoever it is, you're happy to see them. But somebody coming with the with the Bible, hey, could I tell you about Jesus? It's like, oh, yeah, get out of here. You know, why? Because it's it's Jesus that they don't that they don't want. So you know what? I just tell myself whenever I'm opening the door for somebody and showing them Jesus and they're just like, oh, no, thank you. I just think, well, that's not, that's not one of his sheep, obviously, <laughs> you know, and so uh, we'll talk about the other components here in a second. And so, uh, uh, so John the Baptist is this one who is opening up the door. Now, here's the thing, like I use that as a personal example and I think that it, I think that it holds weight, I, you know, uh, if we, if, if somebody preaches the gospel to us and they open up the door, if you will, and introduce to us Jesus, I believe that even now, even now uh, for us in this day, there's something within. I, I think that everybody has, everyone's born with a measure of faith enough to receive the gospel. We're all without excuse. It's not like God created somebody with no faith. And it's not their fault that they go to hell because God created them that way. That's a weird belief that, that, that is actually out there. Uh, but that's not, that's not how it works. I think everybody has enough faith. Everyone's born with enough faith to receive Jesus Christ. And then they can reject that to the point where they're just blinded and, uh, and they're hardened and, and they're not going to ever receive it. Okay, so, uh, so I believe... I can only talk about my own salvation experience. I don't know how everybody else felt whenever they got saved. But I was a really young kid. I mean, I'm like seven, eight years old whenever I get saved, whenever I got saved. And the funny thing is, it's like I had faith. Now, theoretically, if had I died before I actually called on the Lord, well, obviously I would have went to hell because the Bible says, you know, you got to believe in Jesus Christ and you got to call on the Lord uh, for your salvation. But... God knew that I was one of his sheep. Okay, now don't confuse with what I'm saying with Calvinism. Okay, God knew that I hadn't, I hadn't suppressed that faith and that I was looking for the answer. And I know that I could feel that in my heart from the time I was seven years old thinking, I don't want to die and go to hell, but I just got this feeling that if I died, I would go to hell because I've told lies and I've, I've not always been a good boy. And here I am as a little kid thinking, I don't want to die and go to hell. And so... I'm waiting for the answer. My parents didn't go to church at that point, and they weren't saved. And so, you know, if I talked to them, it was kind of like, well, I don't know, just pray and just try to live right and be good. And, and you're a pretty good boy, so you'd probably go to heaven. And I'm just thinking, no, that just doesn't seem right. That doesn't seem good enough. And when the first time I ever heard somebody open up the Bible and say, can I show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven? And I don't remember the exact words he said. And, uh, you know, asked me if I had ever been saved. It was like, I'm like, well, of course, this is what I've been waiting for. <laughs> you know, uh, it's like I was introduced to the shepherd and I was like, ah, 
that's my shepherd, right? And so the only way I can, I can just, in my mind, just know that, hey, I was, I, I'm, I'm, one of his, I'm one of his sheep. I had faith. The moment I received that, it's like, ah, oh, now we have this relationship. Now I'm, now I'm a sheep, okay? <clears throat> the problem, the, the only difference is, with that analogy and this story here, is in this story, he's particular talking about the sheep, the, the, the sheepfold of Israel, okay? That's a huge deal. This is why Jesus said, first go to the lost sheep of Israel. This is why John the Baptist is preaching and all Judea is coming to him, okay? Because this was primarily uh, kind of letting the Jews know who the religion, now Gentiles got saved too, uh, when they converted, put their faith in, G in, in the, the religion of the God of, the, of Israel. Okay, and so, uh, but at this time, they had to finally have this, uh, you know, this moment where they, where they received Jesus Christ. Like, this is the one that you've been waiting for. And so, it was very important in this beginning, the beginning phase, even Jesus, you know, he's like going after the Jews, going after the Jews. Remember the time where there's a Gentile comes and he's like, you know, I can't, uh, I can't stop what I'm doing and, and deal with Gentiles. I've got to go after, uh, after the Jews. Now, of course, Jesus won a lot of Gentiles to the Lord, but this was the mindset. It was like, this is my mission to go to the lost sheep of Israel. Okay. So, uh, um, uh, so it's a good analogy when we apply it to ourselves or anybody else. Uh, that's that's fine, the, being his sheep and all that kind of stuff. But uh, in fact, go to uh, chapter, you're in chapter 10, look at verse 16. This explains, this is like proof of what I'm saying here in case you don't believe me. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Okay, so we understand that Jesus is no doubt, you know, tearing down the the veil. You know, after he after he uh, rises, after he dies, and he rises up from the grave. You know, the the um, the veil is torn in two, representing that you know, hey, we have direct access to God through through Jesus. And it doesn't matter if you're Jew, Gentile, whatever. It just matters that you have Jesus Christ. And so, uh, and so everything kind of changed after that moment. But at this time, uh, you know, there's this particular fold that he's dealing with. But he says, hey, not only that, but there's another fold that I've got to go after too. And then they can be part of this. And there's and there'll just be one fold and one and one shepherd. All right, but he's talking to Jews right now, and he's talking about this fold of the Jews. Okay, so other parables about the lost sheep, the ninety and nine, all that. Those have to do with uh, with this sheepfold that we're talking about. So we talked about the the porter, which is John the Baptist. We talked about this sheepfold, which is the Israel. Okay, the the Jews, the believing Jews. And uh, let's look at the third part here, which is the shepherd and the door. Okay. This is Jesus. I know it sounds funny the shepherd and the door, but, but it makes sense when you ever think, when you think about it, uh, cause not only is he the one who we're pointing people to, right. But we can't go to the father without going through Jesus Christ. Like he's the way, the truth, the life, no man cometh unto the father, but by, uh, but by Jesus. So look at Psalm 23. This, of course, isn't the first time that the Jews would have heard this, uh, this idea about a shepherd and sheep. All throughout the Old Testament, they're referred to as sheep. Psalm 23 is a great passage here where David is comparing, obviously through the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, but he's comparing the Lord to a shepherd. He says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, uh, you know, you see even back then this idea that when you when they come to the Lord, and uh, and they have salvation, 
They belong to, you know, and Jesus is talking about how he's the shepherd. And it's like, you know, you belong to him and he's going to take care of you and he's going to protect you. He's going to watch over you. I mean, this is his job to go seek and to save those who are lost and to, and to uh, gather them up and to take care of them. And so this idea about him being the shepherd, I mean, it's a beautiful picture there. I like the part that says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Uh, I don't know if you know much about sheep or what a rod or a staff is, but I can guarantee you it's not like giving him a massage. <laughs> it's not like uh, brushing his hair with, you know, the rod and, and the staff, uh, you know, that staff, this is the way I understand it. That staff is like a hook and they would use that to pull that thing back, keep it out of trouble. Whenever that sheep's going their own way, about to get into trouble, you pull it back where it's supposed to be. And that rod, you know what that is? I, I, I picture that in the other hand. You bring him back and say, hey, get away from there. Then you take this rod, you go thunk. <laughs> okay. Now, as Christians, you know what? Part of our comfort in following the Lord and being a Christian is, hey, who the Lord loveth, he chastens. And so we start getting out of line. We start living for ourselves and seeking after the things of the world. We should feel this like, and then all of a sudden this thunk, <laughs> right? Because God is trying to like keep you you know, uh, in his, in his care and his protection, he loves you and he doesn't want you to destroy your life and to go after, uh, the wrong things that are going to hurt you. Now, doesn't mean that we're not going to reject that and keep resisting that. And many Christians will still fall back into sin and temptations and, 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 and all, but Hey, we can be comforted knowing that he is going to protect us and he is going to uh, bring us back. Now it said again, that he's the door and we understand that, uh, the Bible says that he's the way. In fact, uh, I was talking a while back about what a Christian is, and we looked at the three times in the Bible where it uses the word Christian. But before the word Christian, you know, one common common uh, word that was used or a title that was used to describe Christianity was followers of the way, right? Of that way. And so uh, I think that's interesting because they were following. This is the way to heaven. This is the, you know, this is the way that we're going to live. This is the way that we're going to, uh, to go. And uh, so they use that word way, which I think is pretty interesting. So Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. And also it reminded me of this story. Whenever I think about a door, again, very early on in the Bible, we see this story. Go to Genesis 7. Genesis 7, 16 the whole world is corrupt and is violent, and uh, and you know Moses. I mean, not, not Moses. Noah finds favor in God's eyes, and he's going to kind of save some animals, and he's going to save Noah and his family, and then just kind of start all over. And he's going to des destroy everything else uh, that's out there. Kind of a picture of God's. I mean, it's a true event. Uh, don't get me wrong, but it's a picture of God's wrath. Uh, which we can we can use uh, even to this day. We can use in looking at the the tribulation to come. Uh, you know we're going to go through tribulation, and then he's going to save us out of that tribulation while he's pouring out his wrath on the earth, and then we're going to come back down in part of the millennial millennial kingdom. And so uh, so there's a lot of great pictures that can be taken from this story. But look at what he says about the ark. What did I say? Verse uh, seven, chapter seven, verse sixteen it says, "And they that went in went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in." I always think that's so interesting when I'm reading that story. It's like there's this one door, must have been a huge door, on the ark, and everybody everybody gets in there. All the animals get in there. They all get on the ark, and I'm thinking, I don't know how the door got sealed. I don't know who shut the door. I don't know how, uh, you know, obviously for animals to walk on, it must have been a pretty big door. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how that all worked. But here's what I know. The Bible says that the Lord shut them in. And I believe that's a great picture, too, where it's saying, you know, God is the one who opens and shuts doors. God's the one who is going to, uh, you know, seal you. Whenever you get saved, you can't keep yourself saved. He's going to keep you saved. You didn't get yourself saved. You know, he's the door. He had to provide that salvation. You had to go through him uh, to even get into the fold. Okay, so Jesus is the shepherd and he's the door. Now, then there is the, uh, the aspect of the thieves and the robbers. All right, let's go back to our text here.
And it starts off right off the bat. It talks about, uh, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Okay, so who would be in this parable, who would be that thief and that robber, that person that tries to come in some other way? I mean, you could think about people who try to get to heaven some other way than Jesus, but I think the thief and the robber there would be those people who teach a false salvation, like false prophets, false teachers uh, that are teaching another way to go to heaven than Jesus Christ. And so when he's confronting these Pharisees, you know, you could think, well, maybe he's talking about every religion that's ever existed before him. Uh, but it seems kind of like he's a little bit confronting them saying, hey, you're teaching that you got to, you know, do good works to get to heaven or you're teaching all these uh, various things. That they, they had all these weird teachings that they had added to the law of Moses and, and they thought you had to keep the law of Moses, all these things to be able to uh, go to heaven. And he's saying, look, I am the way. I'm that door and I'm the shepherd. And the only way you're going to come to me is through the door. You know, you're not going to be able to get in some other way. Everyone else that attempts to do that is just a thief and a robber um, who, who, who is uh, trying to teach another way to go into heaven. So look at uh, chapter 10, verse 5. It says, uh, well, let's go, let's go to verse 4. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were uh, which he spake spake unto them. Of course not, because they were spiritually blind. They didn't, they didn't, they weren't, they weren't saved. And he's calling them out saying, you're not my sheep. That's why you don't believe. Again, you can go back to chapter eight and this is what the whole thing is about. He's like, you're not receiving me because you are, you are in darkness and you've rejected the truth. You've rejected the light. And so therefore, you know, Jesus is like, it's like he's shrugging them off. He's preaching to the multitudes. He's preaching to his disciples. And these Pharisees keep coming and trying to trip him up or ask him these weird questions. And he just, he throws out an answer to him. Like, hey, you're not even the seed of Abraham, you know? And he goes back and talking. <laughs> That's how I picture it. Like he keeps, he keeps uh, turning them off. And then, so and then he begins to talk about these, you know, this parable here. And he's like, you guys aren't, you guys aren't my sheep. Okay, so why? Because here comes Jesus on the scene. John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Now, all Judea has come. You say, okay, well, that's God's people. These are all saved, right? Well, no. The ones who have faith are saved. The ones who are his sheep are saved. But there were certain people who, you know, would have died and gone to hell at that point. Okay? They didn't even have to, they didn't even have to reject Jesus whenever they, he was pointed out to them because in their hearts they already lacked the faith. Okay? But then whenever John the Baptist says, Here he is. And he opens up that door. These people say, oh, I recognize him. He's the Messiah. You know what I mean? So maybe it took some a little bit longer than others, but they recognized him. Now, some, now, now again, slightly different application, but if we try to apply that to ourselves, okay? <clears throat> How many of you ever heard a story about somebody who claimed to be saved? They, they appeared to be saved. They gave all the right answers. And then the next thing you know, they go to some cult. And they're believing some lies about you got to work to go to heaven or you got to do this or you got to be baptized to go to heaven. And it's like, how could they, how could they swap from this preaching to that preaching? And the reason we don't understand how they could swap is because we're thinking there's no way that I would hear that voice and think, oh, that's my, that's my shepherd, right? Because I know because I'm, he's my shepherd. I know his voice. You know, uh, have you ever seen somebody, uh, in the Middle East or whatever, and, they're, and they got sheep. And I've seen YouTube videos where they'll call, they'll call out the shepherd's voice. He'll just, he'll just call out into the air, and all those sheep will come. They'll come running. Why? Because they know from birth, this is the guy that's going to feed me. This is the guy that's going to keep me safe. This is the guy that's going to protect me. Whenever it's raining and storming outside, he's going to get me in a shelter. He's going to do all this stuff. And so, so they understand. They learn that voice of the shepherd right off the bat. 
And I believe if a person is saved, you know, they've, they've sincerely put their faith in Jesus Christ, uh, you know, they've got the Holy Spirit within them, and the Spirit speaks to their spirit, and it's like that whenever they hear the voice of God, they're like, oh, that's right. And so this is why somebody can not really know a whole lot about the Bible when they get saved. And you don't have to worry, like, I don't know, maybe they're not saved because they don't understand this and they don't understand that. No, no. no look, if they put their faith in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ has got that rod and that staff, and he's going to make sure that they learn, <laughs> you know, these things. And we, we may never have it all figured out. But when you point something out to the Bi uh, from the Bible and you show somebody some of the simplest, simplistic aspects of our faith, and you show that to them, and they never knew that before, and they're just like, oh, man, that makes a lot of sense. Right. And all of a sudden, you know, they're maybe even trying to to uh, adapt, you know, and start doing things that they didn't do before or whatever. Again, I mean, we're not perfect. We're, sheep is a good uh, a good explanation or or a, a title for for what we are. Like we're just sheep. You ever watch sheep? They're not too too bright. And we're sometimes like that. It's like, you know, this thing in my life is is going to destroy me if I walk closer to the shepherd. You know, I'll be safe, uh, but that thing over there looks pretty enticing. And so we'll go after the things in our life that are going to absolutely destroy us instead of clinging to the, to the shepherd. That's why, again, we need to feel comforted in his disciplining of us and, his, and the rod and the staff. But he's our Savior, and we know he's our Savior because we put our trust in him. And by faith, he's, we, we, can just, uh, we can just feel that when he calls, we, we can hear his voice. So this is what he's saying to those Jews, he's saying, look, those Jews that didn't accept me, when John the Baptist opened up the door, the porter here opened up the door and said, hey, behold the Lamb of God, the ones that didn't accept me, it's because they weren't my sheep. And so Jesus keeps on going on. He's looking for his sheep. Um, okay, so the conclusion is this. Again, the porter opened the door. The, uh, the sheep that are in the sheepfold, they follow him. And then here's the main point of, uh, I mean, here's the verse that we're looking at, verse 28. Then the sheep are eternally in his care. Okay, verse 28 says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So that just is simply saying that you are eternally part of His care, and no one can pluck them out of His hand. In the Bible, if you look up all the times where it says, like, you're in His hand, or somebody's in hand, or whatever, again, it's, it's a great illustration, but it's not really the picture of somebody being in the palm and, and, you know, hey, you can't get them out of there. It still applies, but the idea of being in his hand is just simply like you're in his protection, you're in his care, and nobody can take you out of that care is the overall, under, that's the way I understand that from comparing Scripture to Scripture. Okay, so sorry to mess up any illustration. You're fine to use the <laughs> the, uh, the the palm example, but uh, but actually, it's it, because it, it still has the same idea. It's it's about you know removing from his possession. There's no way you can move his, you know, you're in his care no matter where you go. Uh, you can't get out of his his care. You're sealed into the day of redemption. So uh, so yeah, we are so glad that we, again we're that. During that time, where are those ones that he was looking off and saying, hey, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. Okay, these are, But eventually it'll all be one fold and there'll be one shepherd. And we're in that time. We're in that, uh, that time frame right now where we don't have to worry about, well, who's a Jew and who's a Gentile and who's a church of God? Have you ever heard a, a dispensationalist say, you know, no, you got to rightly divide. Some of it's for the church and some of it's for the Gentile and some of it's for the Jew. And I'm like, well, maybe back in Jesus' day, <laughs> you know, maybe back in Paul's day, but after that, you know, it was just one, uh, one group of people. You either believe or you don't believe, and it's going to be that way uh, from here on out is what I believe. All right, let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for being our shepherd. I pray that you'll help us be as like John the Baptist and, and be porters and open up the door and, and welcome all people to hear your word and to be introduced to you and to have an opportunity to put their faith in you. And Lord, I pray when uh, people refuse and they reject you, that we can just go on our merry way and find those next people uh, who, who might receive you. And Father, I pray that you will uh, uh, help us to walk uh, 
as, as good sheep and uh, know that we, we need you. We need your discipline in our life when we walk astray. We need your comfort and protection. We can't help. We can uh, take care of ourselves in that way. Uh, but Lord, I pray that you will guide us and direct us. I pray that you will provide uh, um, under shepherds in our lives to guide and direct us. And I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be a pastor and to be able to provide that. Lord, it's a daunting task. But I pray, Lord, that you'll use me to draw people to your word and point them to you and, uh, and provide some kind of leadership. And Lord, I pray that you will just apply this word to our hearts and to our lives. And we thank you for these great verses that we've looked at. Uh, that we use soul winning regularly. And I pray that you help us to just understand what uh, your word says and to use it appropriately, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.